Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Corey Forche and I'm your guest host for the next hour. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that Children's Healthcare Canada's offices are in Ottawa. This is the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place, and we recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this community, our province, and the country. This month, the SPARK theme is immunization, and I'm excited to talk to you during National Immunization Awareness Week. Vaccine development to prevent the spread of communicable diseases, to put it lightly, is probably the single most important achievement in biomedical science and the most effective public health uh, intervention in the history of humankind. COVID-19 vaccines have been dominating headlines over the past year, but we can't become complacent about our routine childhood vaccines. That is why today, during National Immunization Awareness Week, we are delighted to bring you this webinar. COVID-19 and missed routine immunizations, designing for effective catch-up in Canada. Now, before we begin, we invite you to answer a few quick poll questions for us. Please note that you will have to answer all three questions to submit your response. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers for today. First is Dr. Uh, Noni McDonald. Dr. McDonald is a professor of pediatrics at Dalhousie University and the IWK Health Centre in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She was the first woman in Canada to be a Dean of Medicine, and her areas of interest involve global health and vaccines. She's published over 470 papers and has long been recognized in Canada and internationally as an advocate for child, youth health, and a leader in pediatric infectious disease and global health. Alongside Dr. McDonald is Dr. Ev Dubé. Dr. Dubé is a medical anthropologist affiliated with Quebec National Institute for Public Health. She's a research scientist at the Research Centre of CHU Québec and is an invited professor in the Department of Anthropology at Laval University. Her research program focuses on the sociocultural determinants of vaccination. She is the lead investigator of the Social Sciences and Humanities Network of the Canadian Immunization Research Network. She is interested in how to advance vaccine acceptance and uptake, and she is leading different projects around this issue. In other words, we couldn't be in better hands. Just a reminder that we record all our webinars, as mentioned in the introductory video, so please type your questions into the question box at any time, and I'll prompt you via chat as well. I'll pose your questions to the guests following our presentation. It's now my pleasure to pass the mic over to Dr. Noni McDonald. So welcome. Um, as Corey has said, uh, we're going to talk about COVID-19 and missed routine immunizations. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I'm speaking from the Mi'kmaq area, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and Ev is on the ancestral and unceded territory of the huron wendat people. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start with the Immunization Agenda 2030, the global strategy for the next decade. The emphasis on the 2030 IA agenda is that no one should be left behind in terms of immunization. This was approved by the World Health Assembly in August of 2020. It was designed before COVID, but boy, does it speak to COVID and to routine immunization. I want to emphasize that big points in this agenda are it's people-centered, 
partnership-based, data-guided, and then the three stars on the strategic priorities is about vaccine uptake and acceptance and lifelong integration for that. Next slide. So we got hit in, 20, in 2019 and the beginning of 2020 with Omicron. And when we did that, we had to do the social distancing. We didn't have any vaccine. We had shutdowns and closing down. People had to stay home from work, wear masks, social distance. Everything was closed. And then as we headed on to 2021 and uh, end of uh, 2020, we got vaccines. But throughout all of this, we got slammed with the infodemic. And it has had a huge impact on vaccine acceptance, on um, acceptance of the requirements to wear masks, and it's caused us a big problem. If you look globally, Omicron and the other variants have just whipped around the world. So, well, some people got COVID um, the Wuhan early, others it just spread around. Omicron really started to spread, what, four months ago? And there isn't a country now that doesn't have it. And you've seen what's going on in Singapore at the moment. And these new variants are causing us such a problem. And they bring up a whole bunch of other issues. Next slide. So one of the problems with COVID is it's not equitable who gets the bad disease and who has the risk factors for bad disease. Age really matters. This is data from, <laughs> excuse me, from Canada as of last week. And as you can see, the highest risk for COVID cases was in 20 to 29 year olds, but the highest risk for hospitalization was in the over 80s. It is not equal who, when you get COVID, you get it worse or less. And we know this is an underestimated for infections because we only count those that have had PCR testing, not those that were just antigen test positive. Next slide. We also know that it was COVID was not an equal risk opportunity depending across our country. So this is to, an example from Montreal and from Toronto. This was done in um, uh, not that long ago, showed that if you lived in Montreal in a community that had more Blacks, you had a much higher rate of COVID. The same if you were in Toronto and you had South Asians were concentrated in your community, they had a much higher risk of COVID. It was not the same across the country who had the higher risks. There were many factors that affected this. It's not because you were Black that you got worse disease or were more likely to be infected. There were other factors around socioeconomic status, around congregate living, a whole lot of other factors. It's not about your racial background. Over. Next slide. So this is the COVID uh, vaccine uptake rates, and they mask inequalities within the provinces and the territories. I live in what would be called La La Land over here on the East Coast. We have 90.65% uptake of at least one dose of vaccine entire population. So given that we don't immunize anybody under five, that's a pretty high uptake rate. Then look at Alberta. 79.97%. Look at Labrador, 95.8%. Okay. Labrador is hard. It's in the north. Okay. It doesn't have big communities, yet they had very high uptake rates. Next slide, please. But we had lower initial uptake rates among Blacks, Indigenous, and people of color. And you can see where this showed. This was in April of 2021, looking at refugees in the top one, other immigrant groups, and then um, uh, this is Ontario, Canadian-born long-term residents. And you can see the big differences in the uptake rates. A lot of this was about access. A lot of this was about trust. A lot of this was about how well they felt about the vaccine and what they knew about it and who was telling them what to do. Next slide. But the biggest thing that Evan and I want to talk about is what's happened with COVID-19 and its major impact on routine childhood immunization. And this is an equity issue again. If you look at the six World Health Organization regions, you will see but when they went from 2019 pre-COVID to 2020, a big difference in the number of zero-dose children, children who've received no immunization. 
In the Afro region, it went from 7.1 million children to 7.7 million children. There was no, Euro, no region in the um, WHO regions except Euro that did not see an increase in number of zero dose children or children not fully immunized as they should be for routine immunization. So one of the things that's pretty terrifying out of all of this, Israel, Israel, which has had no polio for 30 years, reported its first case of polio in April of this year. And we know for every case of acute flaccid paralysis, that's what the child has, acute flaccid paralysis. There are at least 100 other people that have been affected asymptomatically. This was in a sect in Israel that does not believe in immunization. We could see the same thing here in Canada. We have pockets that don't immunize. This is not a good thing. Ev, what's going on in Canada? Thanks, Noni. So a couple of uh, findings from recent studies or study that was conducted in, in Canada in 2020 to look at the impact of the, um, the pandemic on routine immunization. So here you can see some of data from Quebec. You can see uh, at the top of the slide, the 13 months cohort and at the bottom of the slide, the uh, 19 more months cohort. So you can see that the pandemic did add an, in, an impact on, on immunization, especially during the first wave and the first uh, lockdown. But then the uptake rate got uh, closer to what we could have expected when we look at data prior to the pandemic. Uh, similarly, this slide shows um, Alberta's vaccine coverage in 2020 among two years old, and you can see the uh, measles containing vaccine. Uh, so here the impact of the pandemic was persistent for the old period, and we can observe a 5% difference in coverage uh, due to, to when looking at data from 2019 to 2020 due to the pandemic. Uh, so this is, um, this is, um, showing the impact of the lockdown uh, on the, uh, the vaccine uptake. So we can see that this decline was temporary, that it uh, increased after with catch up, but uh, it was still higher for the oldest cohort. So these children might not have been all catch up. And the next routine immunization vi visit is often at school entry. So at four or five year, years of age. So that means that in the meantime, these children are at risk of vaccine preventable disease. Uh, we also know that school-based immunization program were altered uh, sometimes for a year and a half. Even though these programs are, are now resumed, there's still important catch-up to be done. And we uh, often, when we look at provincial data, we can miss pockets of unimmunized people. And we don't have good data at the really local level, often to know exactly who's been missed and how to catch up. So for instance, this is a concrete example of the uh, consequences of having uh, groups of children that are under or unimmunized. So since um, January this year in Nunavik, which is northern Quebec, uh, there's a pertussis outbreak. And uh, this outbreak is uh, linked to the fact that only 42% of Nunavik children are up to date with routine immunization against pertussis. And of course, this slow uptake is due to many different things. We know that there's been uh, vaccination services disruption, staff shortage, uh, transfer of, of staff um, to work on COVID-19, but also a, a, some level of distrust and concern regarding the COVID-19 vaccine that have been kind of lump, lump into uh, other routine immunization. So even before uh, the pandemic, vaccine hesitancy was considered a treat to global health. So in 2019, it was named by WHO as one of the 10 biggest threat to global health. And uh, vaccine hesitancy was linked at that time to different uh, measles uh, outbreak in different regions that were due to vaccine refusal. 
So what's vaccine hesitancy? It's, it's been defined by WHO as delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccine despite avail availability of vaccination services. So it's important that it's more of an attitude than uh, an issue linked to um, the access to vaccine supply. Uh, but of course, our vaccine uh, services are delivered can influence vaccine hesitancy. So vaccine hesitancy is complex, it's context specific, and it's varying across time, place, and vaccine. It's influenced by factors such as convenience, as I mentioned, the way that the vaccine are offered and delivered can impact vaccine um, hesitancy. Uh, complacency, which is often uh, summarized by the expression a vaccine are victim of their own successes because vaccines have been so successful, people are often more concerned about risk of the vaccine than the risk of the vaccine preventable diseases and confidence. So trust in the system, trust in the vaccine safety and efficacy, trust in the healthcare provider. So this concept also brings this idea that vaccination attitudes and decisions are not um, dichotomous. It's not whether you're accepting all vaccine or uh, refusing all vaccine with conviction. Vaccination decision can uh, be on a continuum with some people still accepting vaccine, but with important doubts and concern and other refusing maybe all vaccine, but unsure about their decision. And when we look at different data from high income country, we can see that it's between 10 to 20 percent of uh, often parents, because prior to COVID, most uh, research were done among uh, for childhood vaccination, but between 10 and 20 percent that could be considered as vaccine hesitant while the proportion of strong vaccine refuser is often less than 2 percent. And this is a uh, recent uh, survey data kindly shared by Curry. Uh, so uh, on the potential impact of the pandemic on the per perception about routine vaccination among parents. Of course, we're still struggling with the potential impact of the pandemic on routine immunization to have a, an in-depth understanding. But in this slide, you can see that for the majority of parents, it didn't change their perception about the importance of vaccination. And it did increase the perceived importance for a quarter of parents, which is also important. So what can we do about trying to catch up missed routine immunizations? And how do we design an effective catch up program? Uh, the WHO has 25 recommendations for getting routine immunization back on track that was presented at the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on April the 4th in 2022. It should be out online in about a month. But I've picked out the ones that are very relevant for Canada. We need to identify under and unimmunized children and adults. And as Ev said, this is really difficult for us because if you missed a school immunization and you dropped out of school, how do we find you? All right. What do we do? How, do you know in your office or in your practice who has been unimmunized or underimmunized for as in young children? Then we need to grow opportunities for routine immunization. We need to detect the delivery gaps in our communities. We need to use all contacts with the health system for immunization. If you come to the emergency room, you should be asked about your immunizations and not just are your immunizations up to date. Most of us don't know the answers to that. All right, because we don't have a place to go and look up our immunizations. We need to have immunization registries or access to our healthcare records so all of us can find that out. The pharmacist should be asking you about your immunizations. Every clinic visit, you should be being asked about your immunizations. And if you're not immunized, we should be putting a good word in to say, please get your, these up to date and here's where you can go and get them. We need to adjust our services for times and places to better meet patient needs. For people, who, for kids who missed the school immunization programs, yeah, in my province, they did catch up programs last summer, but it meant that the mom had to take time off work to bring her child to be immunized. And you know what? They didn't all do that because they couldn't all do that. If you're a minimum wage worker, you know, 
you don't get paid if you take time off work to take your child to get immunized. So we need to fix that. We need to plan catch-up clinics, including those for school-based programs. And then we need to evaluate how well we've done in catching people up and work on the gaps and see what subgroups that we're missing. Next slide. So this brings us to data. We don't have enough data. We need the coverage data, both for COVID, COVID vaccines, as well as routine vaccines. Who's had them? Who hasn't? Where are the groups that have been missed? What's our vaccine program look like? Where are our supplies? What wastage do we have? How are we encouraging people to get immunization? What are the behavioral and social data? What are the barriers and drivers for uptake and also for reluctance of uptake? What's the disease burden? I mean, I think Ev's data from Nunavik about the pertussis outbreak is really important. And I would tell you that many people in Canada don't even know we have a pertussis outbreak going on in Canada. And then most importantly, where are our zero dose children and the under vaccinated children? And what can we do when there are access issues and delays? Next slide. So Ev and I sat on a committee for the Royal College, uh, the Royal Society of Canada w, uh, COVID vaccine acceptance one. And we put into place this a framework for people to think about what you need to do about ensuring and improving immunization. It's complicated, it's complex, but you know what? It's a complex area. A lot of the behavioral stuff focus on, focuses on people in place. It's about their culture, it's about their context, it's about equity, all the behavioral issues, but they are within a whole bunch of other factors that very much affect whether they're going to accept immunization or not. How's the healthcare system set up? How's the immunization system set up? What are their premiers saying and about immunization? What are the programs and practices in place? What are the policies that are helping or not helping immunization to happen? Do they have access to accurate and reliable immunization knowledge? I'm going to talk a bit more about disinformation in a few minutes. And our healthcare workers at every time they meet them, whether those are regulated health professionals or those who are integral to healthcare delivery, are they talking to the people who come in and asking them about immunization and encouraging them to get Im immunized? And then there are the other factors. What are communities doing about it? What's the educational level? What about communications or what about infection control? Can I have the next slide, please? So we know over and over and over, study after study has said the most that healthcare workers, what they say about immunization truly influences whether people will get immunized or not. So if a child is not immunized or an adult has not had their pneumococcal vaccine, it's important for us as healthcare workers to speak up. It's also important for all healthcare workers to be up to date on their vaccines, to know about safe delivery, to know about what communication strategies are the best to do, and to do this in a respectful and positive manner. It's about trust, and trust has two components. One of them is about your competence. What do you know about vaccines? The other one is to show that you're empathetic and you care. And you need both aspects of that, not just pummeling people with vaccine statistics and information. And we know that educating healthcare workers on vaccines and strategies can truly make a difference. And you're gonna say to me, oh, that's old data. No, folks that we've known this for more than a decade, but we also know uh, w, uh, CDC showed that this was absolutely true for COVID vaccines last year. And there's the data to show it. You know, what a healthcare worker recommended for vaccine acceptance totally influenced whether you were going to accept vaccines, uh, the COVID vaccines or not. Next slide. So vaccine decision-making at the individual level is a very complex. It's not static. It varies across time and for different vaccines. But emotions are very influential, much more influential than facts, even when people um, correctly understand the facts. And information alone is not enough to change behavior. How healthcare workers interact with patients is more important than what they say. Next slide. And Ev, over to you. Thanks. And the uh, research around vaccine hesitancy, I've shown a couple of useful tips in how to have those vaccine conversations to enhance uh, vaccine acceptance. And the starting point is to uh, 
identify where the person is on the vaccine acceptance continuum. And the good way to do this is to start with a presumptive statement or an announcement that show that vaccination is the norm, is what you intend people will do. Uh, sentences like, it's now time for your COVID booster dose, or it's now time for your child's second uh, MMR shots. Uh, so why it signals that you have trust and confidence in vaccination and that you expect the person to, um, to accept vaccine. But at the same time, you need to uh, make sure not to uh, be too, uh, to be accepting of people's reaction and then to tailor your advice or your conversation based on uh, where the person is on the continuum. And you won't have the same conversation for vaccine acceptors uh, when the goal is to maintain trust with transparent communication, transparent information about what potential side effects to expect about this uh, after vaccination to uh, make sure that if you do recommend but are not able to deliver the vaccine within your office that the person will uh, move from intention to action make sure to have the all the information to uh, for vaccination um, but also to uh, to address pain and anxiety if you're delivering the vaccine in your office. So that's the usual approach with vaccine acceptor. And as a reminder, most of the patients are vaccine acceptor. It, they only need to be triggered or have some, maybe they have some question, but they won't take a lot of time. However, for the vaccine refuser, you will clearly see a, a refusal of vaccine. And then the goal is to, um, to make sure that you keep the door open, to make sure that you revisit this conversation later on. And the goal is not to, to try to get this person to accept vaccine in one visit, but it's to build trust, uh, to build trust with that, that patient to show that you think it's important to vaccinate, to inform about the potential consequences of non-vaccination. Um, and when you're uh, in front of someone who is uh, a vaccine deniers or an anti-vaccine activist, um, it's important to keep the conversation brief to avoid, um, because often these people are really convinced and the goal is to uh, inform about consequences, but uh, avoid the fact ping pong or the uh, statement, because often these people have a lot of information that they want to share. And often it's recommended that, for instance, on social media, it's better to stop the conversation than to try to reply or to try to provide some facts. Because for this, the artists or of those of this group, it's, it's often really difficult to change their mind. For the vaccine hesitant, who can have some level of indecision or many concerns or, or doubts and questions, it's important to uh, listen and try to identify those specific concerns. We've mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that vaccine hesitancy is complex and multifactorial. So it's often for very different reasons that people will hesitate. And it's also important not to minimize concern, even though from a scientific or a medical background, it could seem uh, unrelevant. Uh, and for those vaccine hesitant, the motivational interviewing techniques are shown to be one of the most effective approach to have a conversation to build trust and vaccine acceptance. So what's motivational interviewing? It's really a, a, a way to do uh, counseling, uh, working on the person's own ambivalence toward positive change. And it's a change of paradigm between talking to patient to work, working with patient. Uh, it rely on a couple of communication techniques, asking open-ended questions to make sure that you are able to capture the concern or the preoccupation of that person, to listen re reflectively, to ensure that your understanding of this person's concern are adequate, to affirm, to validate, to find some way to connect with that person. Often those uh, vaccine hesitant patients uh, are really worried. They've done a lot of searches. So you could say something that I see that you're really concerned about your health. You want to make sure to make a good health decision. That's a way to find some common ground uh, with the person. 
And it doesn't mean that by using motivational interviewing technique, you cannot provide information, but there's a particular way to deliver facts and it's summarized by the ask, provide, verify. So you ask permission before sharing uh, facts if the person agree, which often they will do because just the fact of asking permission decreases tension. Then you provide some information. And the important step is also to check that the person has correctly understood uh, what you wanted to provide. And summarize is a way to close a conversation, to move toward action or to uh, mention to uh, revisit. And then a helpful uh, way to end those conversations is to add some freedom established wording. Of course, the choice is yours. Of course, it's up to you. Uh, you're free to accept or refuse. These type of approach have, have been shown really effective to move people toward acceptance. Also, it's important to use clear language uh, to avoid jargon. Uh, we know that most adults um, have low numeric skills or have issues interpreting um, um, numbers. And the same information provided in different format can be interpreted really differently. So if you're, you're using percentages, for, for example, it's, it's less risk increasing for people than if you're using the same information in a one in 10 person, because you're talking about a person and people can capture, oh, that might be someone I know. Instead, the statistics are um, less increasing of risk perception. We also know that having positive sorry about vaccine is really, really good. So people want facts, but as Noni mentioned, emotion are really driving vaccination decisions. So having good stories to share your own positive stories about vaccine uh, could be really effective. Uh, the use of fact sheet, infographics, the, the visual presentation of number is also really important to help people have a good um, understanding. And we need to be um, not using words that could be uh, misunderstood or that could uh, create um, entrenchment. For instance, the word like anti-vaccine, even the word vaccine is it could, could be badly perceived by some patient and could make them more uh, reluctant to have an open discussion. Um, back to you, Noni. So as I said earlier, I promised I'd talk a little bit about mis- and disinformation information and the infodemic. You know, if Evan and I had done this talk three years ago, we would not have this section. And I will tell you, this is almost the most important section of our whole talk. So misinformation is information that is actually false, but was not created with the intention of causing harm. Disinformation is information that is indeed false, and it was deliberately created to cause harm. Why? Because they wanted to make money, they wanted political gain, or they wanted attention and prestige. And often the message is very simple. It's easy to remember. It sticks and it deceives the public. So the disinformation might be COVID doesn't exist. So if I was worried about getting the COVID vaccine, I don't have to worry anymore because it doesn't exist. It's not a problem. And we know from studies that have been done, if you looked at the misinformation about COVID vaccine, and they did a randomized control trial. Those who uh, they were given a piece of disinformation about COVID vaccine versus those who were not given a piece of, about COVID vaccine and their intent to accept COVID vaccine. In the UK, it led to a decrease of 6.2% acceptance and in the US by 6.4%. This is a big deal. Next slide. And you need, next slide, Ep. oops. You need to know how powerful this is. The Russian trolls and vaccine misinformation did 9 million tweets from 3,500 accounts over a relatively short period of time. We're not talking 10 years here, all right? This is over about a year. And what did they emphasize? Personal dangers, 43% of them. Civil liberties, you know, don't get vaccinated. You should make your own choice. You don't need this. And conspiracy. Ooh, those people are out to get you. Next slide. So what can we do about it? And I'm going to be very specific here and zoom through it. 
The general public is your target. You want to flatten that infodemic curve. You want people to not hear and believe only dis- and see d- mis and disinformation. So you our health, our firefighters. We need to train all healthcare workers and others to speak up. There, I've given you a reference for an open training course that's there. You need to make facts the hook. We need to clear, clearly have shareable data and stories, as I've talked about. We need to be creative. We need to use humor. We need to use emotion. And we do know we need to say what science is. And the more people who speak up that are firefighters, it garners more belief that that is actually the correct information and not the false stuff they've been hearing. We need to fireproof our patients and the public. We need to inoculate them that they are going to hear myths and disinformation. And we need to teach critical thinking and media literacy. And we need to show them the techniques that are being used to sell that disinformation. And WHO Euro has a how to respond to vocal vaccine deniers in public. And it talks about the techniques that are used, conspiracy, fake experts, impossible like expectations, selectivity, misrepresentation, false logic and emotions. And once you teach people this, they start to say, whoa, I see that's disinformation. I shouldn't be paying attention. And we need to send them to transparent and trustworthy independent sources out there. Fire marshalling, we need structural changes in our social information platforms like Twitter and Facebook and other platforms that are out there. I think a lot of us are a little concerned about Elon Musk, who's buying Twitter and wants to say it should be all about freedom of speech, not when a lot of that freedom of speech before had been disinformation and it's causing real impact. Next slide. So we also need to work collaboratively in partnerships with other civil societies, religious organizations, trade unions, the business sector, sports teams, NGOs about the importance of immunization, not just COVID vaccines, but about routine immunization. They need to add their voices to the firefighters because it increases that uh, that uh, how well that's heard. In the United Kingdom, there was an example of this when or- in Orthodox Jewish committees, communities, when they involved their leaders, it eased and, uh, and improved access and flexibility to the program, routine immunization programs, and it increased people's acceptance. Next slide. So what can we do to really inoculate the public? Well, we need to sharpen media literacy skills. If you haven't seen the bad news game, you need to go and do this one. Everybody should be doing it. You can get it free at Get Bad News. It's the UK government has sponsored this. It capitalizes on aspects of social media, and it really teaches you what the trolls do. And when you learn all the steps the trolls are doing, it helps protect you. And this has been shown to actually work. It doesn't matter what your political background is. And for the big one, get uh, get bad news. It's for 14 and up. And the junior one is for kids that are in school between the ages of six and 14. It's about fireproofing. Next slide. Does this work? This slide is tremendously important. Finland decided that they would work really hard on fireproofing. They have a kindergarten to grade 12 education program that teaches media literacy skills. It teaches critical thinking. It teaches them to detect myths and disinformation and to detect pseudoscience and not believe it. State officials were also trained to recognize and combat fake news and get out there with the correct information. They now have the best literacy scores in Europe because they did this. You can teach this. And the nationwide narrative has changed so that they now are much more talking about identity and human rights and rule of law rather than addressing misinformation because they have really protected their general public from misinformation. Next slide, please. So in summary, COVID-19 and and routine vaccines for 2022, where do we go from here? Well, the expectations of the next decade are we're going to have vaccines across all ages and we need to be working on that hard. Routine immunization programs were way more fragile than we thought they were going to be. We need to restore and catch up those people who've gotten missed. Vaccine acceptance is really complex, as that Royal Society of Canada framework shows. Don't use a narrow 
lens to look at what you need to do to improve vaccine acceptance. There's no silver bullet. Context matters. The where you the health of the person matters. The social political situation they're in. The personal environment. We need more and better data, and we need to listen to the concerns of people that have not taken up vaccines. And we need to change our programs to fit them better. We need to target communications. We need better plans in place for crises. We need to avoid mixed messages. We need to build many partnerships and coalitions, not just for the COVID vaccines, which we did, but also for routine immunization. I want to do a sidebar on this. In the United States, they have dropped their average life survival by two years because of the number of COVID deaths. We need to all understand how important immunization is to preventing deaths, not just COVID deaths, but routine, immuni routine vaccine preventable disease deaths. This is a big, huge, important issue. It's also about addressing equity locally, around the country, and globally. We need firefighters. We need more of them. We need more fireproofing and more fire marshalling. And this is not an option. And to everybody who's listening, Ev and I would like to say, what are you going to do to help us do this? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that phenomenal presentation. I think we've learned so much in the last 45 minutes and uh, hopefully uh, lots of great calls to action there as well. Uh, before, um, I, I think I'll try to sneak in one question perhaps because there's one that I really liked that came up, uh, but we're also gonna launch one quick last poll um, which will help us improve our Spark program. Uh, again, you'll have to select all the answers before you can submit and uh, we really appreciate you doing this for us. Uh, one question, which which I, got, uh, I saw asked two different ways and I thought was an interesting question, is should our routine vaccination uh, catch-up campaigns be totally separate from COVID vaccine campaigns or should they be integrated? Are there pros or cons to uh, one or the other? So um, the Immunization Agenda 2020 talks about integration all the time because it has to be patient-centered. And if it's people-centered, you don't want them to have to come two or three times to get something. It should be a one-place you know, one shop where you get everything you need. And we know for a lot of these immunizations, we now have data to show that it's safe to be able to give COVID vaccines at the same time for these. Ev, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I think there should be uh, it. There should be both addressed. I think it might have been a good thing, however, to have split the two vaccine because the COVID vaccine have fueled some uh, different reason for hesitancy. And I think that the fact that it was presented at two, as two separate program might have had some benefit for routine immunization. But that being said, once you have someone in front of you, you need to check not just COVID vaccine, you need to check all other routine vaccine and this, this vice versa. I think it's important to address both. Um, we often say when doing vaccine hesitancy research that all vaccines are different and people might hesitate to for the HPV vaccine for different reasons that it might hesitate for measles vaccine, for instance. So you need to be aware of those different reasons to be able to uh, tackle concerns. And we emphasize that at any time they come into the healthcare system, we should be asking about vaccines and telling them about where they can get their routine immunizations or the COVID vaccine if you personally can't actually provide them. Thank you very, very much. This was all so interesting. And I'm definitely going to uh, take from this and, and learn more about what I can do to advocate for better vaccine data as well. Okay. Uh, there's a question here about my repeating the decrease on average life expectancy in the U.S. two years. It's predominantly due to COVID. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Some harsh uh, statistics. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's actually the end of our time together today. So thank you again to Drs. McDonald and Dubay for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thank you to all our members and all other attendees for choosing to join us. If you liked the presentation, please continue uh, to participate in the conversation and tweet why immunizations are, point, are important to you using the hashtag NIAW2022. We all get to be firefighters during this National Immunization Awareness Week.
Um, starting next week, we move into our Child and Youth Mental Health Month. Join us on May 11th for informing equitable child and youth mental health, tailoring to support diverse groups with uh, doctors uh, Bukul Islami, Tricia Williams, and Jennifer Zwicker. And a new episode of our Spark Conversations podcast will also be released on May 30th, featuring Dr. Chaya Kulkarni, with whom we will be discussing infant and early years mental health. It's always great if you watch live, but as your questions and comments really enrich the discussion. Um, but if you can't, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network. So thanks again for joining us. Thanks to Drs. Dubé and Dr. McDonald for this presentation, and hopefully we'll see many of you here back on May 11th. Goodbye, everybody.